by Shmuel Hanavi. And uh, no, it was not the Ramban, it was not any of those. Uh, it was not David Melech, it wasn't uh, Ali Melech, but it was Shmuel Hanavi, and Shmuel Hanavi it was. This week's question, who was Naomi's husband? And the answer will be in the next show. You can text me the answer, 347-927-8398. And uh, Mazel Tov to Aaron Silverstein. And off we go to our guest, uh, Abe uh, Brodsky. And, uh, okay, Nisim? All right, yes, Abe, are you? you there? Yes, I'm here. How are uh, you? Very good. So, uh, all right, uh, for those who doesn't know Avram, Abe uh, Brodsky, he's been in a uh, band for quite a while five uh four or five years and uh he's been doing drumming and other instruments um first of for all tell, tell us uh, number one uh you know number one where, you know how did you uh start doing the band and how did we uh how did we start uh, playing the instruments and what does it require um I started playing the drums when I was about 12 years old. Um, I grew up and I was raised in Elizabeth, New Jersey. Um, my brother was uh, about three years older, older than me, and um, he bought a drum set, and he started taking lessons. And like a year later, I said to my mom, my mom, I, wanna, I think I want to take lessons also. So I started taking lessons. And uh, we had a pretty cheap drum set, but it was good enough to learn, learn on it. And um, I took lessons for a little bit under a year. And the drum teacher said I was doing very well. And next thing I knew, um, I went down to Baltimore, Maryland, to uh, Nair Israel Rabbinical College in the high school. And I ended up buying a better drum set and bringing it down to yeshiva with me. Um, I met a keyboard player, and we would practice on Friday afternoons, and then we would do um, l'chaim parties, the vart, like chassid engagement parties, and we played for the high school a little bit. So that's how I got started all uh, the way back then. So that, that's only the drums, uh, but you do, uh, somebody told me you do play... Uh other instruments right yes that is correct so what other um, instru I, instruments do you play i play the electric guitar and i play the clarinet also so I'll explain what is a clarinet the what's clarinet. a clarinet a clarinet is it similar to a drum what's a clarinet a clarinet is a all black instrument that's very narrow and thin and it was once called many many years ago in america i think it was called the black licorice like the candy licorice because it looks like a piece of licorice but it has a lot of holes in it um the holes are covered with pads and by pushing down the pads and br blowing on the reed, it's called a wood a woodwind instrument because it has a wooden reed made out of bamboo. And when the reed when the reed vibrates, that produces a sound through the instrument, and it has a wide range of sound. It can be played at a very low octave or at a very very like a screaming or a screeching, very high level also. And it's a lot of fun to play. It's really fun. Wow, so, so it's like more like a uh, trumpet type of an instrument, right? It's closer to a saxophone, like an alto, um, an alto saxophone. There's so many kinds of saxophones. There's a soprano, there's alto, right. there's tenor. And um, I tried the saxophone. It was a little too difficult for me. So I figured I'll try the clarinet. And I'm mostly self-taught. And... Um, it's interesting because a real, real professional clarinet, which is usually made out of wood, could cost around $4,000, so it's not cheap. 
to play. Well, that's but definitely, um, definitely not cheap, no. <laughs> no, the, the real professional ones are made out of wood, and the keys are even almost um, silver-plated, I think. Wow. So let's start with the clarinet. How did you learn to play the clarinet now? Um, I bought books that showed me how... I knew basically how to read music from playing the guitar, and... I, I read the notes on the staff, and then I was very lucky that um, one of the famous music people is named Avremi Gurari. Avremi J, of I know Avrami very Jay. well. Avremi, if, if, you're sitting, if you're listening to my show, a big shout out to you, and uh, Bezaz Hashem, you should come on my show. <laughs> yes, he definitely should, because he's multi-talented. He is multi-talented, but he doesn't admit that. <laughs> um, I was lucky enough, he explained to me that a piano and a guitar are played in the key, the concert key of C, but different instruments are played in different keys. My clarinet is a, a B-flat clarinet, so the music is written... Um, one step lower than keyboard music. So I had to buy a B-flat clarinet book from Avrami Gurari. And once, I, once he emailed it to me, because nowadays he doesn't make spiral books, he emails it over the Internet. Right. And I started um, painstakingly blowing each note at a time and learning. I started with songs that I knew the tune to, and I found the notes that matched the song that I knew in my head, and I started blowing one note after another, and little by little, I got a little bit better, and I invested in a better clarinet, and I have a nice Bundy student model, which uh, I bought online for a little bit over, over $500, mm -hmm. and it's very nice. I enjoy wow. playing it. So Mostly that, that's on the clarinet. Time. That's the that's the history of your playing uh, clarinet. Yes. So no, it no. only started about three years ago, but I really enjoy it. So how did you start? So the drums you started, uh, you went to where was that place again? You Elizabeth. Went to, you went to a university to learn the drums. So tell me, how, what 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 type of uh, instrument uh, is the drum type of thing? You know, what is it considered? Yeah. Drums is a percussion instrument. One of the beautiful things about the drums is what we call the dynamics mm -hmm. in music. Dynamics means how hard or how soft I hit something, how hard I could hit the piano keys or the strings on a bass guitar or electric guitar right. or an acoustic. So the dynamics is like if I could put, I could play very soft or very loud, and with the drums, mm -hmm. an acoustic drum set, I can control how loud I play, how loud I crash the cymbals, how loud I, how loud I hit the bass drum. And it's great because some songs are soft and meaningful and I can play a very gentle beat. And mm -hmm. some, like wedding music, is very, very loud, but it has a range of soft to loud based on the dynamics. Right, wow. So... Uh... What, 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 you know, this is like a, a talent show, and you know, mm -hmm. a talent show, uh, we uh, mostly when you have the talent show like this, so this is like you know, and you and you played in bands, yes, right? So that means you uh, must have played in front of weddings and stuff. And uh, so, how many years you are doing the bands? Well, the band is not in existence at this time, but we did play together for five years, and we practiced once a week. Every, every Friday, Arab Shabbos, we practiced together, and it turns out that um, I met the musicians um, in a different um, venue, and they were not Jewish. One of them played um, electric lead guitar and lead vocals. The other one played electric bass. And for the most of the part, we were playing what you would call classic rock and roll. We were playing the Beatles and, and stuff like that that wasn't Jewish. But we did go in Lakewood to the Leisure Chateau, which is a 
nursing home and rehabilitation center. We went there no, numerous times, and not only did the patients um, enjoy it, but even the staff, it was, it was so nice to see their faces light up, to give them a little break in the day that we played all types of music that people from the last generation could sing along to, and they enjoyed it. Wow, that's really amazing. Do you, do you still uh, like play uh, in, the, let's say, by weddings, or you don't really play by weddings anymore? I I do not play by weddings. No, I was a roadie for Shmuel Claver, Sam Claver, or Shmuel, he calls himself, from Nagina Orchestra, around 2000, 2001, and I was at that time living in Elizabeth, New Jersey. And I would drive my car to Muncie, New York, and pick him up. I hope he's not listening. <laughs> oh, it's okay. And um, we would go into Bur into Borough Park, into Brooklyn, and into Staten Island. And I would set up his drums. And it was a very big honor for me because I got to sit next to him. And I listened to the, one of the top. At that time, Nagina was the top orchestra and it was just an amazing so, so I saw Shlaimi Dak singing and uh, maybe Ephraim Freed I saw one time. I saw one time with Captain David. And it was just an amazing experience to work with Shmuel Claver. And um, in fact, I believe um, his son just got engaged that he's making a chasna in um, Florida coming up soon. Oh, okay. That's Mazel Tov to what, what was his name again? Shmuel Claver. Shmuel Claver on the on the son's wedding that's coming up. Yes. So you don't play a band. How did it feel to uh, play in a band? What What was the feeling like? You know, I know a lot of times even singers. I remember Shlemy Dex was here in the, our studio. He uh, came in once and he uh, he told us what it's like. But uh, I'm wondering, what is it for a band player? Like, if a band player would make a mistake. How do you cover that up? Do you, is there, you know, the, is there like a feeling to that, or? Um, we do make mistakes. Um, one time, I was playing with my band, and I was singing also, and during the middle of the song, I kind of, I got um, clumsy with the lyrics, with the words of the song, and we just had to stop in the middle, but usually it doesn't happen because we practiced every week and we knew our routine. We had a, a list of, a set list of songs and we really knew our stuff very well. The key mm -hmm. to not making mistakes is to just keep practicing over and over and over again. Wow, so and if you do make a mistake, it happens, so it, it's not the end of the world. So usually the band players won't make mistakes, it's only the singers. That's what I'm hearing. Um, <laughs> well, I don't know. Um, right, I'm saying mistakes. you play the drums, right? So if you made a mistake, yeah. that means they had to stop the whole thing. At one time, yeah. Oh wow, yeah. that's that's bad. that's. Uh, uh huh. No, I was just thinking. I don't know how 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 does I'm saying like you know how do people different people cover up you know their mistake you know, and this is a talent show, so it you know it does take a lot of Kindle who are listening. It does take a lot of talent to uh, play those drums. And let me tell you, you got to beat on those uh, drums with those drumsticks. And not drumsticks from a chicken, but drumsticks that are uh, wooden drumsticks. Uh, tell me, what what type of drumsticks are there? there are, are they different types? Are they wooden? Are they... Uh, most of them are wooden. A very good company is Vic Firth. And the ones I like the best come with um, like a rubber grip on the bottom half of the stick so the sticks don't fly out my hands. Because that actually happened when I was playing. My hands would get sweaty after playing for like an hour straight and the drumsticks slipped right out of my hands. So the ones with the rubber coating are really good. They even make gloves for drummers to wear to, that they shouldn't lose the grip on the stick. Wow, that's unbelievable. So they, they put, like, certain material in back of that stick to uh, be able to play those drums? Yes, they do. Oh, that's, that's uh, you know, I, you know, I never gone that close to a band player. I mean, 
I've uh, you know uh, videoed uh, band players by, but you know I've never seen actual. I've never been the one actually playing the drums. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, well I'm drumming right now on the table, as you heard about that. Um, so well, we're speaking for those who don't know who are joining me now. Uh, I'm speaking to Avram Brodsky. And uh, do you still uh, are available in playing in bands, or not, that's no more anymore? Um, I would really like to play with other musicians, but um, I'm not looking to join a, a wedding band at this time. Oh, all right. Okay, fine. So we're speaking to Avram Brodsky. He was talking about his uh, terrific instruments, and uh, we were just discussing how he plays the drums. The drums are a very interesting instrument, and, uh, you know, there's one thing about the drums that uh, I like what Eli Melech Adler you know, mentioned to me about drums. He mentioned there's a foot piece. Now, I, I know a lot of times you have this foot piece, and you're, you, I don't know, how do drum players, I, I've never thought about this question, but this is an interesting question, what I thought up just now. How do drum players do the drum and press that pedal at the same time? Uh, well, it takes coordination, and we actually have a name for it. It's called independence, to be able to play um, one speed with the hand, one speed with the feet. It's called independence, and sometimes we also do, syn we also do a syncopation, where we play one beat, and then the other beat is off the beat. So it's like, um, instead of one, two, three, four, it's one and, two and, three and, four and. I'm playing on the and of the note instead uh -huh. of the... So the, the bottom piece is an and. That, that's uh, what I'm listening uh, That's what I'm uh, hearing, right? Yes, a lot of times it's an and, that you got it, you got it, yeah. Uh -huh, wow. That's, that's, that's a good trick to know, to be able to play on the and instead of playing on the one, two, three, and four. That, mm -hmm. is, that is really... Uh, Unbelievable. Actually, um, I just want to add one thing. You, you yeah. spoke about fingers making mistakes. Did you know that the clarinet, when um, when mm -hmm. I'm practicing, it, it's kind of easy to squeak and screech without right. planning because if the airflow doesn't come out of my mouth the, the right way or I'm not holding the holes, I'm not covering the holes completely, I could make a screeching sound, and that could also be really embarrassing, too. Oh, wow. So how does that work out? What, I mean, the screech, how do you make that screeching sound? What does that mean, to make the screeching sound? It, it sounds exactly like blowing a whistle. In the middle of playing a song, all of a sudden you hear a whistle blowing. It, so, it throws everyone off. Mm -hmm. that's, 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 like, really interesting. I never, you know, I've never... Uh, thought about the, these type of things what you mentioned just now that uh, you know playing drums that uh, could be so hard now uh, uh, clarinet uh, you ever played clarinet with a band or that's like uh, that's like your own time or what that's my own time I have a dream I would like to play in, I live in Lakewood I would like to play for like a chuppah some of the soft songs that, that the Hassan and Kala walk down to, to the chuppah, I, I, I love to play soft, mm -hmm. emotional, because to play it really fast takes many, many years. There's an amazing, amazing player named Chilik Frank. Chilik Frank, he might yeah. have from, He's a Yerushalmi, and he, he, he puts out CDs, and he's super fast and amazing, but right. I like the slow, the slow music. Maybe one day I could play at a chuppah. I would really mm -hmm. like that. Wow. Wow. So, uh, those who are listening, we're listening to, uh, what type of instrument is a clarinet? That's like a trumpet, you said, yeah? Well, a trumpet is technically a brass wind because mm -hmm. your mouth goes on brass, metal, and right. a saxophone and a clarinet are woodwinds because even though the, the, clar the saxophone is made out of metal or brass, but the thing that causes the sound to come out is the reed, which is made out of, like, bamboo or some type of wood. So anything right. with a reed, the wood that goes to the mouth, mm -hmm. is a, a woodwind. So a trumpet is a brass wind, I believe, 
and um, a clarinet is a woodwind. Wow. So, uh, in order to play a clarinet, uh, so you play professional clarinet. That's uh, you know. Well, I play. I play locally on Purim in my brother's house. We have a big mishpacha. I play Adelo Yada and Vina Hapo Yichu and you know Misha 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 Misha. You know all the. Um, you know. All the I, nice- I wish I wish I could see the clarinet because you know that's why I like actually a lot of times I interview and sometimes people can't make it which is okay by me but you know the best I love is when people make it in to the studio and they show their instruments of what they brought I mean obviously you're not gonna put a drum in the studio because the studio mm-hmm. is a little bit uh, on the small side but you could definitely fit a clarinet <laughs> definitely yes. I agree. I hope I, maybe one day I can bring it in. I hope so. Right. Okay. So wh- what can you tell the kids, the, the children, the time's running up for uh, the interview? Because I did mention it's only going to be like a 20-minute interview. Mm-hmm. Uh, what can you tell children that are listening to this, uh, to this uh, show? And, uh, you know, what, what could we tell them that, uh, you know, how to improve their talents and, you know, and let's say they make mistakes, and you know, what what should what what would your advice be to children who want to uh, you know educate themselves? Well, I'm glad you asked because I did have some drum students, and I made up a funny saying, which is a little funny. Okay. But I said, usually we always say practice makes perfect. That's but correct. only Hashem is perfect, and no human being is perfect at all. So I, I said, instead of saying practice makes perfect, mm-hmm. say practice makes improvement. The more and more we practice, the more we, we get better and we improve over time. Right, that's why they don't feel bad. Mm-hmm. We may never be perfect, we won't be perfect, but we could always improve. Practice more. Keep practicing every day if possible. I hear it. So... So what what can you tell uh, you know like the children let's say uh, you know they're listening then they have uh, talents what what would your advice be on kids with talent? I would say choose one instrument for most of the time and do not try to play multiple instruments. First, set out with one instrument. Watch people ask a lot a lot of questions as many questions as you possibly can because there's no stupid question. Keep asking and study it if you can. Take lessons and practice. And don't be afraid to play in front of an audience because it's a little like public speaking, which is scary sometimes, but we overcome it little by little in front of the audience. Right. You know, I'm, I, it's funny. When I was younger, I always say this in front of people who I interview, and I'm going to say it right now again because there is always new people listening. Um Lana is there to say, well, I'm telling you, Schmelke, there is something to say. When I was younger, I would never have dreamed of being here in the studio giving a show. Do you really think you give me a show? Eh, nobody's listening. Oh, I'm telling you, a lot of people are listening. Uh, yeah. But, yeah, no, I I never dreamed of this. Uh, you know, I was very uh, quiet back then. <laughs> back in, uh, oh. when I was a young kid, I was very quiet. And uh, mm-hmm. for those who are uh, listening and watching me here on Instagram, you can follow Avram Brodsky, Ab- Abraham Brodsky, uh, Abraham Brodsky. What, what's your Instagram uh, line um, for name? people to follow you, um, you, you know? It's Abraham Brodsky 5. Abraham Brodsky 5. And, uh, you know, you... You know, you can even, I'm sure you can request music for him, and he'll maybe play it for you. I don't know. Right? Will you? <laughs> yes, I, I do. I, I do try to take requests as best as I can. Yeah, I right. do. You, you know, there is a person I know in, who lives not far from Lakewood. His name is Elimelech Adler. I, I don't know if you know him. I don't know him. No, so Elimelech Adler was here once. And he, mm-hmm. he uh, says uh, something very interesting for kids that they need an outlet. What, what's your, you know, what, what do you think, kids? How do they take an outlet? Like, you know, um, an outlet could be um, shooting hoops with basketball. Could be riding a bicycle. 
could be going swimming. It could be um, listening to your favorite CD, or nowadays we have DVDs. Whatever your parents approve of, each parent is different, but there's nice ways to just relax. I like to listen to music. I personally watch YouTube videos <laughs> on YouTube, and um, I learn a lot from watching other musicians. Same here. <laughs> yeah. Right. Okay. So this is Avram Brodsky. He's a uh, drum player, clarinet player. Of uh, what would you say? Another player, guitar player. Yes, a little bit. Yeah, I do uh, play a little guitar. And uh, there is, a, is there any other instrument or? This is no, like... no, just three. So, what's your final word to children of uh, uh, of the you know what, what to tell? What do you uh, want to tell the children? You know about the little chizuk for them to about their talent. <laughs> um, study hard in yeshiva, do your homework, but always give yourself time to relax at the end of the day. And if you decide to play an instrument, um, keep at it. Don't give up. <laughs> and try to find a good friend who you can practice with. All right. Uh, thank you, Avram Porotsky. And uh, this is uh, Kishroni Hour, and I am uh, right here with Avram Porotsky. Thank you so much. And uh, have a great Shabbos. And, you know, if you can come in, you're welcome. Anytime that I'm here, I give my show on Thursday nights from 7 o'clock to 8 o'clock, and it's uh, 7.28. And... Uh, yeah, so uh, can I call you about Rome or you, that's not allowed? Anything you want. I'll answer to anything. I'll be <laughs> uh, from whatever you, you right. feel comfortable. Okay, so we're talking to Rabbi Avram Brodsky. He plays the okay. drums and he plays the guitar and he plays the, he plays clarinet. And, it, you know, it was a pleasure talking to you. And, you know, next time hopefully you come into the studio live and, uh, Hopefully everybody is going to gain chizik from that uh, uh, valuable lesson that you gave over. It's very appreciative. And uh, I'm looking forward for you coming into the studio of Ezez Hashem in the near future. Thank I'm, you uh, so I'm much. going to wish you a great Shabbos. And uh, Ezez Hashem will be in touch still. <laughs> okay. We'll okay. be in touch. Thanks. All right. Okay, oh. Bye-bye. All right. That was Avram Brodsky, everybody. And uh, that was Avram Brodsky. And we still uh, got more time over here. I'm sorry, guys. I still got more time. I am running the show myself tonight again. And uh, so, uh, okay. A little bit of the music news. Music news. Oh, boy. Uh, do I got news for you, boys and girls and whoever's listening? Oh, look at this music news that I got. Thank you, Yossi Z, for emailing this. Wow. Shlamey Kaufman just released an acapella cover of Yaakov Shemeki's Perfect World. Uh, I, you know what, Shlamey? I would really love to listen to this. So if you can email me. Oh, and it's composed by Yitzi Wolner. Of course, Yitzi Wolner is a long, famous composer. And uh, Bezat Hashem, we are going to get him in the studio. We are working on it. And uh, Bezat Hashem, in two weeks, we are having a surprise guest. And, you know, people are asking me, what is going to be the surprise guest? Is it going to be somebody good? Is it boys and girls? It's going to be somebody really unbelievable. It's... uh. I, I really got to thank Shrilly Meyer for this, uh, um, for the, uh, bringing uh, him in and working on it so hard with me. And it's really, it's, it's unbelievably, uh, pre it's really unbelievably, uh, appreciated that, uh, that I, uh, I'm privileged to, uh, work with, uh, Shrilly Meyer on this. Um, and more coming up for the music. We do have Mayor Green, Meyer Green. I'm not sure what he calls himself, but he came out with a acapella video called Ki Ani Yehudi, which I watched and I did love it, and it was really uh, an amazing video. Um, oh, Yoni Stern came out with a uh, acapella CD. Uh, Yoni Stern, Yonatan Stern, he's uh, he's been in the singing business for a while, 
and he's been doing Israeli songs. Oh, of course, everybody knows this one. Uh, Ari Goldwag came out with Smile. Now, I watched this once, and it's really, really good. And I am recommending for those who can't watch on YouTube to download it on computer and watch it. It will give you a chizik. Um Also, Hillel Klapnik, a friend of mine, gave me a request to say this. Hillel Klapnik came out with El Yohanovi, also an acapella. And if you want to go to his website, it's Hillel caps.com www.hillcaps.com and he owns a studio and yeah for more info you can uh, go to his website and uh, he'll contact you from there and yeah so getting back here are you getting back no i am not getting back i am actually um going back to where i left off you know boys and girls rav shaila kastir it was just his yard site. I, I have to mention this because, you know, it was just his yard site. And really, boys and girls, Rav Shaila was a, he, he uh, was an amazing person. And uh, really, he was, he was a really big gadol. And you know what? Uh, I, I do have a story that I, um, I do have a story for everybody. I'm sorry, everybody who was watching. I have been having uh, internet trouble. Um, anyways, um, but yeah, I do have right here a story of Rav Shaila Kastir. One month to Shabbos, Rav Shaila, he was eating Gamlava Malka. A chazza came to him with a request. He had a warehouse, this person. And he came to him. And his warehouse had mice in it. And his whole livelihood was threatened. I love for bracha. That the mice leave. And, of course, at that time, there was a small town in Europe ruled by a, a church, by a, a cloister, what they call in Yiddish. Or a, uh, you know, uh, some, uh, it's called a church. And anyways, this person who's in charge of the cloister, the church, well, they were kind to the Yidden. And some of them were very, very mean to the Yidden. Well, Rav Shaila asked the Chassid if the person, this priest of the town was kind or was this person very mean to the Yidden. Well, the Chassid replied, he's very mean towards the Yidden. Rav then told the Chassid, go to his warehouse and tell the mice, tell the mice Lazoi, like this. Ready? Listening? Rav Shaila says to go to the state of this church per leader, this cloister leader, this priest. And lo and behold, the mice listened to and the uh, chassid went and did this, and the mice listened, and they all went into the direction of the priest. And that's a little picture of Rav Shaila Kastir, which uh, I, you know, that story was a really unbelievable story because, you know, mice originally do not understand to human language, boys and girls. You know, boys and girls, if I talk to a mouse, I mean, I, you know, that would be really ridiculous. Anyways, you know, there was once a story, Rabbi Yeshua Ben Levi and El Yohan Navi. Oh, and a story, I want to read it. Okay, Shmelki, go ahead. You can read the story, and uh, when you're done, I'm just going to open my eyes, and I'm going to wake up. Okay? Okay. So, Rabbi Yeshua Ben Levi and El Yohan Navi. Uh, okay, uh, Shmelki. What about Rav Yeshua the Levi? Can you tell us anything about him? Um, Rav Yeshua the Levi, first of all, was a Tana. Yeah. And he lived in the time of... I don't remember that. Oh, of course not. But he was a big, huge Tamachacham, and he saw Elio Anavi. Uh, yes, he did see Elio Anavi. Um, anyways... <sighs> So, 
So anyways, um, so anyways, uh, back to, uh, uh, back to my video here, back to my videoing. Anyways, Rabbi Yeshua ben we're talking about Yeshua Levi and uh, Leo Anavi. Um, so basically Rabbi Yeshua uh, Le ben Levi, Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi, um, he was a huge Talmud Chacham, and there was a story, once Rabbi Yeshua Levi, he, uh, Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi uh, encountered Cain Mo upon Elio Anavi, and he asked Elio Anavi if he could go with him, that he could learn from his ways. Elio Anavi said, uh, you know, I, you can't come with me because you're not going to understand anything I do. And uh, Rabbi Yeshua Ben Levi said, um, anyways, I still want to be with you. I still want to uh, go with you on the way to, uh, to be with you on your journey. And they went out together. Well, lo and behold, they reached a hut, an old hut. What's a hut? A hut is like a house. Nowadays we have bricks, and those days they had a hut made out of wood. Okay, thanks for explaining. You're very welcome, Schmaltz. Um, so this elderly couple, they were sitting outside, and they were very poor. But their poor didn't matter. They were welcoming guests. And as soon as they saw the travelers, they jumped. And they came over to uh, Rabbi Yeshua Belevi and Elio Anovi. And they were lacking so much. But what they had, they're willing to share. And they did their best to do the mitzvah. Well, the following morning, the two travelers told their hosts, have a great day, and uh, etc. Be matzliach. Rabbi Yeshua Belevi saw Elio Anovi was davening. He listened very closely. What Elio Anovi is davening for? Well... He heard that this elderly couple had a cow, and Elio Anubi was Davini, that this cow should die. I, I don't understand, Rabbi Shua Levi told himself, I don't understand. I can't understand. Why? Why did he daven for this cow to die? What's going on here that, he, that they deserved it? Did they deserve it? What is going on? That they, uh, that they deserved such a thing. Well, anyways, Rabbi, Leo, uh, Rabbi Yeshua Belevi was told um, by Elio Anavi, he can't ask questions. He didn't ask any questions. Well, they went on their journey, and they came upon a beautiful, rich person. Oh boy, well a rich person. Sometimes rich people could be mean. Yes, sometimes rich people could be mean. But I uh, assume most of the Yidden Shin rich people are nice. Um and they came in and they saw them. Nobody gave them hospitality, nobody gave them a bed, nobody offered them anything. They asked the owner of the house, a wealthy person, to spend the night. Well, fine. And he went uh, over. He went over to uh, the house, and they, uh, you know, right? They just gave them nothing, basically, a little bit of food here and there, and fine. And the morning they came, uh, you know, they woke up. Rabbi Shua and Malavi and Elio and Avi, they woke up, and they were going to go on their way. And he noticed El Yohan Ovi davening again. Rabbi Shua Ben Levi notices El Yohan Ovi davening. And what is he davening? That the wall of this rich man should stay strong. This rich man's wall was very, very, you know, it broke. But El Yohan Ovi was davening for this rich man's wall to get fixed. Rabbi Shua Ben Levi at this point, you know, couldn't understand that. He he doesn't understand why, why 
And how can it be that this poor person, you're, you're praying for the cow to die? And this rich person, the wall to get fixed? What is going on here? Why? But he had it to keep to his agreement. And his agreement was, boys and girls, his agreement was that I can't ask. Well, so they came to a beautiful city. Everything about the city was beautiful. And they made their way to Shul. It was a nice place. Design was nice, beautiful, everything. Even the benches was comfortable. Every Shua thought they would have no problem receiving hospitality, having, uh, you know, they would show, thought for sure they would have people come in to, uh, you know, to uh, invite them into their homes and everything like that. But nobody came over to them. Nobody asked them. Well, they had to spend the night. Rabbi Shua, Belevi, and Eliyahu, and Avi had to spend the night. They had to spend the night. You know where they had to spend the night? They had to spend the night in their, in their, uh, they had to spend the night in their, uh, they had to spend the night in the, what do you call it? They had to spend the night in their, in their, uh, they had to spend the night in the, the shul, the town shul. Anyways, uh, welcome back, Nisim. Uh, uh, you missed a wonderful interview with uh, Avram Brodsky. And uh, uh, by the way, there's a caller call in. I don't know who, uh, what he wants. Um, uh, he might be a junior reporter. I don't know. Um. No. Okay. I guess uh, no junior reporter. Uh, at this point, boys and girls, if you are... Yeah, I don't know what happened to my junior reporter, Nisim. You know? I don't know. I thought you have to follow. <laughs> Try to follow it. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, we're talking about a story, Rab. Uh, you know, I said the story about Rav Shalik Kastid. It was just in your site. Uh, Rav Shalik Kastid is your site. And I said a story about the mice that he went in the city that this person came to Rav Shaila for a bracha, that the mice go away from his uh, warehouse where he stored a whole bunch of things. And Rav Shaila asked him about the priest in that neighborhood, if that priest was a uh, wicked person or not. And uh, Rav Shaila and, uh, asked him, and he, the person answered that the priest was mean to the Yidin. And uh, Rav Shaila told the person uh, this advice to talk to the mice. So this is where Shaila Kastir, he was unbelievable. You know, I, uh, I want to tell you that I was, I was last year in his, uh, uh, in Kastir. I was you were last year in Kastir? Oh, yes, tell, I wow, that's, uh, you know what, that's really unbelievable. That's, my, my, that's it was, it's really unbelievable place, you know. And you see where you used to where, where is, where is it located? That's it's, number uh, one. Hungary. It's Hungary. Hungary, yeah. Hungary, yeah. Uh, and Boys and girls, I do come from Hungarian background. Again, Nemtro Tiaknek. Yeah. Anyways, and right. Uh, I, I, tell you, I tell you a story about something that I heard over there. And um, it was a Hasid. It is a Hasid in England that had a problem with uh, the authority over there. And unfortunately, he got a uh, verdict to be, uh, to be jailed. And uh, he decided to go before he go to jail. He had a date. Uh, let's say it's like a Monday morning, it's supposed to be supposed to be in a jail in a certain city in, in England. And before this, he took an uh, aeroplane, went to Hungary and pray over there. Uh, and, uh, in with, uh, in behalf of the Rabbi Yashayale. And he asked him, uh, please, please pray for me, pray for me. And uh, so he, go, he went back to England. And he make like a small nether. He said, if everything will be okay, uh, he will donate every Motei Shabbat to that Suda Revit, David Malka Meshicha, in uh, in the place of Kastir. And he went to the, the jail in the morning, Monday morning. He said, hello, yes, knocking on the door. Yes, what do you want, mister? 
I said I come to 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 send to spend to send my to serve my time. And uh, look, look, look! I say, I'm sorry, sir. Your name is your name is not here. We cannot accept you. How? Oh. And okay, so I said okay. Next week, we went next week. Come next week, the same exactly. The third week, I said, listen. We know your name, you know, you, we know your name, you know your address, you know, we will call you when you get all this. <laughs> Until today, it didn't get uh, the, the... So, till today, we have uh, in the... Rabbi Shalek Mikasti over there, Sudar Avit, every Motei Shabbat, and the Akarat Atov of this Hasid. Wow, that's an unbelievable story. Anyways, I'm going to continue my story where, where you're talking about this... Uh story with the uh, we're talking about Yeshua ben Levi now with Elio Anovi in the story now and uh, they're walking together in this uh, path and they met an old person and the uh, old mishpacha poor mishpacha and they went in and they Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi heard just to recap the Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi listened to Elio Anovi's tefillah that uh, you know He's asking for the cow to die. And the next place, he went to a rich person, and the rich person didn't invite him in. And uh, the rich person wasn't kind to him, and he said this rich person had a wall, and this rich person had a wall that was breaking, and uh, Leo Anovi prayed for the daven for the person's wall to stay fixed. And Rabbi Shuab and Levi was... up to right now they came to a town where they're very rich and nobody invited them and they unfortunately had to sleep in the shul well in the morning Aliyah Novi made a bracha for these people and wished them they should all become leaders I mean Yeshua Belevi was thinking to himself what? why? they're gonna become leaders? they didn't do anything they didn't do nothing for us and you're going to I don't understand this, but a deal is a deal. They can't. He can't ask the question to Leon Novi because he made a deal. Well, that night they came to another city. It wasn't so wealthy. The shul was not as fancy. The people were very beautiful. And when I say beautiful, it means beautiful in Midas. They did everything they could to make them comfortable. And before leaving the city, Elio told them, May Hashem bless you, that only one of you become a leader. Okay, Rabbi Shua Belevi couldn't hold himself. I can't understand this. He told Elio Anavi, I know I'm going to forfeit my right to come with you, but you know I can't go like this. I don't understand. I don't understand. Elio Anavi said, let me explain. This elderly person that we met first, who always performed that kindness, and was destined for this woman to pass away that day. And by hosting us, she gave the opportunity for a mitzvah, and that hospitality was enough for the decree to be uplifted, to be gone, but not entirely. So I daven for the cow to die. And... and Rabbi Shua and Levi asked Leo Anovi, what about the wealthy home? Uh, the wealthy home, he has a great treasure behind that wall, which he's never going to find because that wall is so strong and he's not going to be able to knock it down. And Rabbi Shua and Levi asked, what about the people in the rich city? You asked for them all to become leader? Yes. Well, you know, he said, they should all become leaders. Tell me, if everybody's a leader, who is anybody going to listen to? They're not going to listen to anybody. So, yes, everybody become a leader is a destructive thing. And what about in that poor city where you gave only the bracha that one should become a leader? Right. Well, you know, he said, yes. In this poor city, in this poor city, I gave a bracha like that because one leader is what we need. One true leader is what we need. Now, Kindleach, I'm not saying that in, uh, you know, the Geishevelt, uh, uh, one leader is good enough. No, you do need other leaders. But when we say one leader, 
by Yidden means like, you know, one person who decides halacha, one person who you go to, you could disagree, you could disagree with the person. You could, uh, you know, you can argue with the person. That's fine. But once uh, when this person is a leader, and it's a big bracha that one person is a leader for that person because, and that town, to have one person as a leader makes less machloikas. Anyways, we're going to continue with another story. Really? Oh, I know the story. I remember this story. Do you? Well, please don't say it because this is a very interesting story and I think it's, I'm going to gain a lot from this story. And I only have nine more minutes left. And if you wanted to be a junior reporter, you can call in right now to be a junior reporter. And um, uh, Nisim is right here. He's going to take your call right away. Right? Yeah. Okay, good. We're making sure. <laughs> okay. I said I said to who if anybody wants to be a junior reporter, they could call up right now because yeah, okay. Nisam is right there. <laughs> I'm here. I'm here. I'm waiting for a um, junior reporter. Last, you know what? Oh, text us. You know, the, you know that uh, the text us. Uh, it's also. Uh, you know, Nisam. I usually don't do this on the air. You know, call me at nine one seven. Six zero two seven nine eight one, and I'll work out with you to be a junior reporter. And uh, you could call me at nine one seven six zero two seven nine eight one. I don't want my phone ringing a million times because that's uh, you know I, I have that anyways. It's ringing a hundred times during the day. I have all uh, Baruch Hashem. I am a very busy person. Anyways, we're gonna tell the story about Rabbi Hanina Ben Doisa, who's a very poor person. Wow. He was so poor, he had nothing. That's right. Uh, Shmelki, good job. Yes, Rav Hanina ben Doisa, he was a poor person. He had nothing, but his meters were excellent. Every Friday before Shabbos, she was throwing a burning coal into the oven so the smoke would come out of the chimney. Well, one day, a bad neighbor, a nasty neighbor. Oh, no, I hate nasty neighbors. Yeah, you hate them. I also. Like, you love every Jew. Yes, I love every Jew. But who's to say this uh, neighbor was Jewish? We don't know. Anyways, who says they hated him? They probably didn't even hate him. But anyways, this neighbor said, I know. They don't have anything. Let me go see what that smoke is about. And she knocked on the door of Hanini Bedosa's wife was horrified and went to hide into a room from embarrassment. The nosy neighbor entered her anyway, and a miracle happened. She found in the oven loaves of bread. She said, come, come, bring this bachelor. Your bread is starting to burn, and you need to get it out quick. Rechani, but that's why I said, that's what I went into the room for. And indeed, the Chacham say, she was saying the truth. She was so accustomed to the miracles that she wasn't surprised that the coals turned into bread. Later, Rechani's wife asked him, how long have we to suffer like this? Rabchanim, but they said, what should we do? She said, Davin, that we'd be given something of value. He Davin, and a hand-like thing stretched down from Shemayim and gave him a leg. He later dreamed, he had a dream that night, that all the righteous people, all the tzaddikim in the world come to be eating at three-leg tables while he and his wife only had two legs the table. He asked his wife, Will it be okay with you if all the other tzaddikim are eating out of three legs while you and I are eating out of this one leg? And it's missing one leg? We have only a two-leg table? Uh, so what should we do? She asked. Davin, that it should be taken away from you. And he davened, and it was taken away from him. The Chacham would say that the second miracle... The second nest that happened to Rav Hanim ben Daisa was greater because that says they give, but usually they give. Shemayim, they give. Hashem gives, but not all the time does he take back what he gives, right? Like, let's say a reward, right? Not all the time does Hashem take back the reward, but Rav Hanim ben Daisa was special. You know, Rav Shem, we're going to talk about a little bit of Shem ben Chai. What can you say about him? Like, Boimer's coming up in a few weeks. He was the holiest man that ever lived. 
And besides, he wrote the Tsar. He was a master of the Torah and a miracle worker. He was one of the uh, few Yidden who spent every time learning. No conversations, no coffee breaks, and no vacations, only Torah. Well, everyone was surprised when the day that after Rosh Hashanah, he showed up at the door of his nephew's home and began to lecture them about the importance of giving tzedakah. Well, although the people didn't have money, the, his uh, nephew, he didn't understand what, uh, what he was saying. They listened. When Rav Shimon spoke, everyone listened. Give with an open hand, Rav Shimon, uh, Bayechai said. Don't worry about tomorrow. Hashem is going to provide. And most important, write it all down. Every penny you give, write it down and carry the list with you at all times. So, what well, we're trying, what Rav Shimon Bayechai, I believe, is trying to say, any tzedakah you give, write it down on paper. This way you have proof. And a bad gazera, I guess, won't fall on you. Well, I want to see a big sum at the end of the year. Rav Shimon made them promise and he left. Well, uh, boys and girls, I really have to finish the story. But what can I say? It's really a, it's a, it's a, it's a, Baruch Hashem. It's a really uh, nice story. Uh, so, almost a year later, they had a strange visit from a person, a Roman soldier, who ordered them to be arrested. You Jew! You're accused of selling silk! And you didn't pay the tax to the government! And they began crying and protesting. But to no avail. No avail. They were given a choice. Either pay 600 dinner or produce even a more prized silk garment for the king. Well, so fine, when Rav Shimon heard what happened, he rushed over to the prison and gave, got special permission. Where's the account of Sezdaka, he said. How much did you give? Here they replied. Rav Shimon took the money, the how much they gave, and he noticed they almost gave 600 dinner. They were just 600 dinner short. Do you have any money with you, he said. They produced six dinner, and they sewed it in their garments in case they needed it. Rav Shimon took the money. Bribe one of the officials. The charges were dropped and they were released. Rav Shimon explained to them what happened. This Rosh Hashanah I dreamt that the government would demand 600 dinner. That's why I told you to give tzedakah to negotiate the decree. Then why didn't you tell us about it, they said. We would have given the money immediately. But then Rav Shimon said, you wouldn't have done the mitzvah for its own sake. There was once a year who owned the cow, which he plowed his field. Then it came to pass that this yid became impoverished and was forced to sell his cow to a guy. Anyways, boys and girls, I have one minute left. So, uh, anyways, uh, continue to move tomorrow, uh, uh, next week. So basically, I'm going to continue the story with this cow. But in short version, this cow would not uh, work on Shabbos. It's called a cow that would not work on Shabbos, and the name of the cow is Yochanan, the son of cow. This week's parsha riddle. It's not a Tasha riddle, it's a Megillah riddle. Who was Naomi's husband? And believe it or not, it is in Megillah. It is, says it in Megillah right in the first Pasuk. And the answer will be given next week. If you know the answer, you can text it to 347-927-3279. This has been the Kishwani Hour. Official Shachter is next, followed by great stuff on Jamie Radio. Don't go away. I'm Moshe Grofeld on here, Kishwani Hour. Thank you for listening. We're Anytime for everyone. This is J Root Radio.